to see you. Um, when we open the floor for questions, however, we do ask that you wait for the microphone to get to you so that our friends that are joining us virtually can hear you. So we will have some of our students um, making sure that microphones get to you accordingly. If you do not get a chance to do so, we ask that all attendees please register their attendance, regardless of whether you are intending to collect CEUs for this event. This will just allow us to keep accurate a record of those in attendance today. You can use the QR code up on the screen. You can use the one in your program. And if you're attending virtually, uh, the link to that will be shared in the chat. If you are going to be collecting CEUs, you can simply select that option in the form and then please provide either your BOC provider number or your PT license number accordingly. To collect CEUs, we will then send a post uh, program event via email within the next 24 hours. That program survey does need to be completed in order for you to uh, then receive your CEU certificate, which will also be delivered electronically. If you have questions about that, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at sluptat at health.slu.edu. I'll bring this QR code up many more times <laughs> throughout the duration of the programming if you happen to miss it now. So at this time, I would like to invite our campus minister, Aaron Schmidt, up to the stage to lead us in this evening's invocation. Aaron. Thank you, Katie. So this week I was reflecting on the tagline for IOTA Tau Alpha. Uh, we heal those contending for the prize. How appropriate as I look out and I see you all, um, faculty, staff, students, and guests who serve one another and those in need of healing. But what does this service look like and how can we characterize it? For many faith traditions, an anointing with oil is ritually used for healing someone who is sick. One summer as Pope Francis was healing from surgery, he reminded us that it is not only the act of service, for example, an anointing of oil, or for you all, a whole array of therapies, tests, and treatments, but the way in which it is done that sets us apart. He says this oil is also listening the closeness, the care, the tenderness of those who take care of the sick person. It is like a caress that makes you feel better, better, soothes your pain and cheers you up. All of us, all, need this anointing of closeness and tenderness sooner or later. And we can all give it to someone else with a visit, a phone call, a hand outstretched to someone who needs help. You are great students and those who will be inducted future healthcare providers to be here for induction into IOTA Tau Alpha. As people learning and working in a Catholic Jesuit institution, may you take time to reflect on how you wish to serve and heal those contending for the prize. And may God bless you with the strength and desire to always accompany the sick and injured with listening, closeness, tenderness, and care. Amen. Thank you, Aaron. I'd now like to invite Dr. Bernard Rousseau, Dean of the Doisy College of Health Sciences to the stage for opening remarks. Yes. Oh, well, good evening and welcome to our 13th annual athletic training speaker series here at St. Louis University. Um, today's event is hosted by our uh, program in athletic training, a program in the Department of Physical Therapy and athletic training here at St. Louis University. The AT speaker series is a wonderful opportunity for us to gather um, each year to honor eligible students for the National Athletic Training Honor Society. I would like to thank the IOTA Tau Alpha leadership for joining us today and leading us in the adduction ceremony of our uh, newest members of the society. We will also be recognizing recipients of athletic training scholarships. The Brandy Burgett Memorial Award and Scholarship in Athletic Training, which honors the memory of Brandy Burgett, an alumnus of the SLU AT program, the scholarship recognizes students who display exceptional courage, determination and passion for the AT profession in Brandy's memory. 
I would like to recognize and thank Bob and Marnie Burgett, uh, Brandy's parents, for their generous gifts, as well as their support in establishing the Memorial Gift uh, Scholarship and for joining us virtually. So please join me in welcoming uh, the Burgett family and thanking them for their support. We will also recognize the recipients of the uh, Bowman Endowed Scholarship to commemorate Clarence Bob Bowman, a model for aspiring APs and a pillar of our community who took care of SLU and St. Louis Cardinals athletes for over 50 years and earned a spot in both the National Athletic Trainers Association and the SLU Athletic Hall of Fame. The scholarship recognizes outstanding athletic training students entering their second professional year. Also wish to thank our alumni, preceptors, and members of the local sports medicine community and welcome our faculty and staff and students for joining us this evening and extend a warm welcome to our distinguished keynote speaker, Dr. David Howell, an expert on concussion assessment and rehabilitation from the University of Colorado. Dr. Howell is a prolific scientist in the area of sports medicine, biomechanics, neuroscience, rehabilitation, and pediatrics. And last, but certainly not least, I would like to thank our distinguished panel for sharing their expertise with us tonight. Thanks to all those involved in planning for their support in hosting tonight's event. I look forward to our evening and time together and hope that we can continue to engage in these important conversations about the role of ATs and improving outcomes and the role that uh, you all play as health professionals in advancing the knowledge and clinical application of evidence-informed concussion management. Thank you, and enjoy your evening. Thank you, Dean Rousseau. We will now move into the recognition ceremony portions of our program, and I'd like to invite the IOTA Tau Alpha leadership team up to the stage to lead us in the IOTA Tau Alpha initiation. Please join me in welcoming our ITA president, Jeremy Grease, ITA vice president, Marissa Eaker, and ITA Treasurer Julia Martinez. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed with the initiation ceremony. Please allow me to introduce the initiates as they come before you. Initiates, as your name is called, please make your way to the stage or remain on stage for the duration of the ceremony. Please hold your applause until the end of the ceremony. The IOTA Tau Alpha undergraduate initiates of 2024 are Carolina Donlinger, Mary Gogola, and Morgan Laundry. The IOTA Tau Alpha graduate initiates of 2024 are Jennifer Hassler and Lauren Smith. The IOTA Tau Alpha Society has been established to recognize and honor those individuals in the field of athletic training education, who through scholarship, integrity, and outstanding achievement have been a credit to their profession. You have been chosen to become members of IOTA Tau Alpha because you have fulfilled their ideas. The Honorary Society of IOTA Tau Alpha was founded at Troy University in the year 2004 by John H. Anderson, Program Director of Athletic Training Education. The objective of IOTA Tau Alpha is to foster a high standard of ethics and professional practices and to create a spirit of loyalty and fellowship, particularly around students of athletic training education. The Greek letters which represent our names were chosen because they represent the summation of the initial letters of the founding society. You have heard the purpose and objective of IOTA Alpha. If you are prepared to further the, these purposes and objectives, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, please state your name. Promise to uphold the Constitution, obey the bylaws, promote the objectives, and work for the good of the society. Then, by the virtue of the authority vested in me as president of the Alpha Chapter, 
I declare each of you to be members of Iota Tau Alpha. Will you now please step forward as your name is read and sign the official role of the society? Caroline Donlinger. Mary Gogola. Morgan Laundry. And Jennifer Hassler. The colors of the society will now be placed upon you. Please join me in congratulating the Iota Tau Alpha, Alpha Iota Chapter Class of 2024. Our initiates will please gather with our ITA leadership for a group photo. Thank you, initiates. And now to recognize those students who have been awarded uh, one of St. Louis University's athletic training scholarships. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Anthony Breitbach, Vice Dean of Doisy College of Health Sciences to introduce the Brandy Burgett Memorial Award and Scholarship in Athletic Training. Thank you everyone for coming. This is a wonderful day. Thank you, Katie, for your wonderful leadership. Thank you, Dean Rousseau and Aaron. Welcome. Um, I, I have the privilege of introducing the Brandy Burgett Scholarship. Um, Brandy Burgett came to us in 2011 from Chaparral High School in Temecula, California. Um, she was like any other student. Back in the days when they used to come down to South Campus and get their pictures taken for the composite photo. Um, she was a volleyball player. She she um, played club volleyball here, and and she was like any other athletic training student we had. But little did we know that she was suffering from Crohn's disease and a very bad case of it. Um, she was constantly under medication. She was in pain. Um, and did not let on because she loved being an athletic trainer here at SLU. Um, here at SLU, she she was very much a part of what's going on. She did have to sit out one year um, to be able to um, deal with her illness. Um, and she successfully graduated in 2017. Um, she was, to every person in the program, you'd have no idea that she was hurting the way she was. Unfortunately, in December of um, 2017, I received a call on Brandy's number on my cell phone, and it was Bob Burgett and telling me that Brandy had passed. Um, and as we were working with um, Bob and Marnie, um, trying to think of an appropriate way to um, uh, honor Brandy's legacy, um, they came up with, they wanted to sponsor a memorial award that recognized people that had brandy spirit, not just grades, not just, you know, all kinds of other honors. It's the people that really love the profession and 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 dug in and maybe worked their way through some diversity, um, adversity. Diversity is good too. Um, uh, I would like to welcome the honorees 
Um, Ai Chin Hugo Lee. Jennifer Hassler and Mark Romero up to the stage. Now we would like to welcome Bob Bergette to say a few words. Bob, Thanks. be patient Thanks, with us. Tommy. Are you able to hear me? Tony, are you there? <laughs> are you able to put on your video? Uh, no, the video is off. <laughs> okay. That's okay. Um, it, it's fine not to have it on. I just wanted to take a moment to uh, thank you, uh, Tony and Katie, for uh, allowing us to uh, to speak on Brandy's behalf. And uh, and Marty and I both, uh, um, as I think this is going to get easier every year. It's it's it doesn't. Uh, Brandy is in our life every day and. She loved going to SLU <clears throat> and she enjoyed the program and under Tony's leadership um, overcame a lot of adversity as, as Tony stated. Um, she's a very stoic person and uh, um, Jennifer Hassler and um, I'm gonna, Hugo Lee as, is the, your, your name that everybody goes by from what I understand and, and Mark Romero. Uh, Wanted to thank you all for applying for the, the scholarship. And we uh, hope that you can take this uh, amount of funds and, and apply it to where you have some gaps uh, uh, to help you out. And uh, I encourage anyone in the audience who might have the opportunity to apply next year to please do so. Please uh, take the time to put together a couple paragraphs for the committee and hopefully you can be a uh, part of this award next year, but thank you all. And uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Tony and Mr. and Mrs. Burgett, and congratulations again to the Brandy Burgett Memorial Award and Scholarship in Athletic Training recipients. It is my honor to introduce the Clarence Bob Bowman Endowed Scholarship in Athletic Training. This award commemorates the legacy of Bob Bowman as a model for aspiring athletic trainers with tremendous positive influence in his community. Bowman has an extensive career as an athletic trainer, providing athletic training services to our communities at the collegiate and professional athlete level. His services have been recognized with his induction to both the National Athletic Trainers Association and SLU Hall of Fame. The Bowman Scholarship recognizes a second year athletic training student who exemplifies the same dedication to athletic training as Bob Bowman. Please join me in congratulating this year's recipient of the Bowman Endowed Scholarship in Athletic Training, Marissa Eaker. And now for our main event. As we move into the keynote presentation of the 13th Annual Athletic Training Speaker Series, 
I will offer a reminder and an opportunity that if you've not yet done so, please complete the registration form regardless of whether you are collecting CEUs so you can appropriately account for attendance of this event. The QR code is both in front of you as well as on your program. And for those that are joining virtually, you'll find a link to this in the chat. If you do intend to collect CEUs, please just indicate so in the form and then provide us with either your BOC provider number or your, your physical therapy licensure number as appropriate. Within 24 hours, you will receive a post-event survey that must be completed in order to collect your CEUs, which will be delivered to you electronically as well. If you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us at sluptat.health.slu.edu. And now I'd like to invite uh, treasurer of Iota Tau Alpha, Julia Martinez, to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. David Howe. Hello, everyone. Um, Dr. David Howell is an associate professor and director of clinical research in the Department of Orthopedics at the University of Colorado Medical Campus and the research director at the Children's Hospital Colorado Sports Medicine Center. He received his PhD in 2014 from the University of Oregon in biomechanics and neurophysiology and completed a postdoctoral research fellowship in sports medicine at Boston College at Boston Children's Hospital in 2017. He is a director of the Colorado Concussion Research Laboratory, which is extramurally funded by NIH, DOD, and other funding agencies. Dr. Howell has authored over 200 peer-reviewed publications in journals across the fields of sports medicine, biomechanics, neuroscience, rehabilitation, and pediatrics. Please welcome David Dr. Howell. Thank you. All right, I'll get the... Uh picture off of or the slide off of a picture of my face because you can all see my face. Um, thank you all for uh, attending tonight. I know it's a Monday evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in St. Louis with, with each of you tonight. Um, thank you to uh, Dr. Sniffen for the invitation. Um, and it's been great to, to meet and interact with all of you. Um, first of all, I just want to pause and recognize how wonderful you all are. This is a really cool ceremony to be uh, in the presence of. And there's certainly something really special here. That, that you can feel as an outsider. So I just wanna pause and reflect and say, this is, a, this is an amazing place and, and it seems like you guys have real strong leadership. Um, and and I'm a, it's a pleasure for me just to sit as a kind of an outside person and, and be a part of it. So thank you for having me. Um, we're gonna switch to a uh, concussion talk here. Um, disclaimer, I, I am an athletic trainer. So you can see the AT behind my name. I have not treated a patient for over a decade. Uh, I feel like we all have our own strengths and weaknesses, and uh, research is certainly one of them for me, and I've leaned into that um, at the cost of some other things, including patient care. Um, I'm fortunate to work with a lot of athletic trainers and, and physicians that, that do see patients, so I'll try to give a balanced perspective, really, of what does the information, the, the data that we're acquiring in our research studies actually mean to you in the clinic with a patient in front of you. And I feel like I should probably um, change the title of this talk to life is more complex than a single analysis. Um, everything that we find is you look at an analysis, you try to find an association or some sort of cause and effect, and, uh, and, and then you peel back a layer and, it, and it's a little bit more complex. So you'll see some of those themes come up. Um, as far as disclosures go, these are my funding sources. They're the ones that really fund all the operations that we uh, have here. Um, and so I uh, want to give them uh, do credit. Mostly, I'm here on behalf of the, our, our research laboratory, and these are the people that truly are the ones doing the, the, the work. I get the pleasure of being kind of the one that, that helps guide and, and direct and, and uh, hopefully gets enough money to fund the whole operation through grants. Um, but these are the people that are doing the work, and I'll give, I'll give due credit to them for each analysis that I show. Um, whether or not you know them, most of them, you'll, you'll read their names in papers if you haven't already. Um, in the coming years. So these are truly, truly wonderful people. So I really wanna outline three things. And, and really where I'm starting from is athletic trainers are excellent at diagnosing, recognizing concussions and removing athletes from the field. And so I'm gonna kind of fast forward from a, a concussion has happened because I think most of the athletic trainers in here are, are aware or are becoming aware of um, how to recognize, remove, um, and, and seek referral if needed. Then where do we go from there? And so really where I'm gonna start with is, is kind of, uh, well, I'll go through three different things and I'll, I'll show hopefully some data that convinces you to, 
to peel back those layers and think a little bit more deeply about the elements of concussion assessment um, uh, and kind of early guidance for athletes that have had a concussion. Um, and then moving on to how do you how do you monitor recovery as it happens across time? How do you know when that athlete um, is able to go back to sports and, and go back safely? And then we'll move on to kind of the third objective along that time course um, would be after they return to play, then what's going to happen? What can we do to help athletes reintegrate back into sports and, and get back into sports safely? And really the, the main um, kind of place where I'm coming from is the, the goal for every patient is to get them to go, uh, get them to go back to the things that they love doing, right? So for athletes, high school athletes is primarily uh, the, the population that we study. Um, uh, some young adults as well, but really for a high school kid that gets a concussion, it's a, it's a big injury. And, um, and how do we help them understand, uh, what they can do to help themselves and help guide them back to doing the things that they love to do, whether that's sports or school or social events or, or things like that. So we'll start with, again, I think I don't need to go over all the prevalence estimates of how many concussions happen a year and, and what you do. Um, I think most of the people in here know this. I think people that have assessed concussion on a routine basis know that reliance on symptom skills alone is not going to tell you the whole story, right? So most of you probably would endorse some symptoms right now. Maybe you're a little bit confused by me already. Hopefully not. Maybe, uh, maybe you're tired. It's been a long day. Maybe you're having a little bit of trouble concentrating because you didn't sleep well last night. All of those things could be attributed to a concussion, but also maybe not, right? Um, and so uh, the, that combination of head trauma plus symptoms um, are kind of the, where you start with concussions. But we know that, uh, again, those of you that treat athletes probably know that they are going to probably underreport their symptoms. But in our clinic, we, we also see athletes that overreport their symptoms, right? So a person comes in, um, especially to our neuropsychology element of our program, and um, you kind of peel it back and you say, wow, actually, they don't want to be playing football. Um, and so they're feigning their symptoms. So, so I think oftentimes athletes, not oftentimes, but occasionally athletes can under, or excuse me, overreport their symptoms. And then even if the athlete is honest and they're telling you truly I feel better, the physiologic disturbance or the secondary sequelae that occur after a concussion and all of the modifications that happen to their lifestyle um, may also produce other things that, that manifest. And we'll get into that in a little bit, but that may not reflect physiologic healing of the brain and all that summed up, the treatment is going to be challenging, right? And so that's kind of the framework in which we're starting that really kind of sets forth a lot of the data that we'll be presenting. So if you have, are not aware, and I think most people in here are, in 2022, a bunch of us uh, concussion nerds uh, went to Amsterdam and talked about concussions for two days. And then there was kind of a closed door session where all of the quote unquote experts from the various elements of, of the concussion world hashed out what was good, what was bad, what does the evidence support, and produced like 16 papers. And some of them are real dense. Um, there's one summary that's kind of high level. I encourage you to check it out if you're interested. One of the things that came out of this that um, I think a lot of uh, maybe non-specialized people in, in not in the sports medicine world, uh, as, as all of you are, um, is to get the, the conversation away from early on post-concussion, after about a day or two, Exercise and physical activity is not harmful. And in fact, it's good. So encouraging people to sit in a dark room anymore, we've moved on from that for the last decade. And now the evidence is support, that we have the evidence to support that after about a 24 to 48 hour rest period, we want people to get back into movement, right? Physical activity. Now that doesn't mean go back to playing full contact sports. And that's what this is. This is kind of that graduated return to play uh, process, six steps. Somehow they made it more confusing. That's not really the, the, uh, the purpose of my talk tonight either. Um, but I hope that each of you can take this and kind of adapt it in your own setting. So then when we look at like, what is the evidence to actually support this? We look at some really good um, uh, blinded randomized control trials where you have a group of individuals with a concussion and you randomize them to aerobic exercise versus stretching. So a non-aerobic form of exercise. And we see at the group level, the group that was uh, prescribed aerobic exercise recovered sooner on average than the people who were prescribed stretching. So that's really good news. Let's have everybody exercise post-concussion uh, and, and everybody will get better sooner, right? And that's kind of the takeaway from that. 
again, step back for a second and realize, well, <laughs> people are not that simple. People are complex. They have various uh, patient goals. They have various needs. Um, they're going to respond differently to different doses of types of rehabilitation or treatment. And so a few questions to think about with physical activity or exercise. Again, two days post-concussion and you're advising an athlete, go exercise. So what type of exercise do you want them to do? You want them to swim? You want them to go do CrossFit? You want them to do um, uh, you know, resistance training? Do you want them to run, get on a bike? How much do they do? 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes? When do they stop? At what level, how comfortable are you with as a clinician saying this is the level that you stop at? What is that based on? Is that based on perceived, ex or perceived uh, exertion or is it based on their heart rate? Um, what, what do you actually tell them to do? Uh, is it working? When do you monitor them? How, how do you adjust? Where do you kind of fit in the progressive elements of increasing exercise? And then largely, how do you ensure that they're actually doing what you tell them to do without physically monitoring all the patients that you might see? And so building on that, we'll turn to the literature. And um, again, I'm coming from an adolescent perspective, probably the same uh, across the age spectrum. But um, this study on the left here asked, uh, or sorry, they, they randomized um, patients in the emergency department to either moderate rest or minimal rest. And they kind of define that the two or, or greater than three uh, based on what the person did and essentially found patients didn't listen to them. So then uh, I got my first big grant and I was really excited. I was like, we're gonna enroll all these high school kids and we're gonna have them, we're gonna give them this exercise recommendation and we're gonna you know, either tell them to do an optimal level, 100 minutes a week of exercise versus kind of just do whatever your, your doctor tells you and, and the, the kind of conclusion from this was I spent like three years and several hundred thousand dollars of taxpayer money to tell me that adolescents don't listen when you ask them to do something, right? So apologies to the, to the taxpayers, but that's what we see uh, right here. Oops, that's not the right one. Um, what, the middle one, all right. Oh, it's just not showing up. Okay, so um, uh, as you can see on, on panel A there, in the first four weeks, we said, you know, go out and do this very structured heart rate based exercise. Um, and, and the volume was essentially the same over that period of time. Okay, well, let's move on. So then let's think about volume. So what do we tell patients as far as how much they should be exercising? Should they be exercising five minutes, 10 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, how many days a week? Again, on the left is a study out of the emergency department that, that randomized people to kind of this symptom guided gradual return to exercise or just consistent 30 minutes of daily light exercise, uh, they found no difference in recovery between the two groups. So some sort of like light exercise had a similar effect. Um, you can see at days 14 versus 30, their, their uh, symptoms are decreasing. So perhaps good, but also perhaps spontaneous recovery. What we found from that previous study that I just showed you, we kind of um, clustered all of the, the same group. And we said, what is the optimal level of exercise based on how, uh, how much people exercise and if they uh, experience symptom resolution in four weeks of that monitoring period. And we found actually that a much higher level of aerobic exercise than what's pr uh, traditionally prescribed, which is 160 minutes a week, what's kind of the best classification accuracy. So the people who exercise more than 160 minutes a week, um, they had a much higher um, likelihood that they would have no longer have symptoms at the end of that four weeks relative to people that were below that threshold. So kind of pushing the envelope on volume, I think, uh, again, if you kind of step back over the last 10, 15 years of concussion research, uh, we kind of went from, you know, concussions are maybe no big deal, keep playing, and then we swung so far to the side of you don't let anybody do anything until their symptoms get better. And you think about just removing athletes from their everyday life, and, uh, and all of the symptoms that that may produce, right? Sit in a dark room and you're gonna get, uh, have trouble sleeping and that's gonna pr produce all sorts of other secondary effects. And so I think that we're still a little bit away, uh, quite a ways away from pushing the envelope to doing too much post-concussion exercise um, with, with good reason, of course. So we're kind of in this search for the, the habitable zone, right? When we're looking for extraterrestrial life, we're looking for uh, a star and, and, and not too hot, not too cold, maybe the Goldilocks kind of uh, paradigm. Same thing of, of really what we're looking for as it comes to post-concussion exercise, not too much or, or too intense. You go, you go too far 
too soon, you're going to get an inflammatory response, symptom exacerbation. But at the same time, if you're doing too little or too low intensity, there's not going to be that cardiovascular benefit. There's going to be a minimal treatment effect. And that's kind of where uh, that guided us into uh, several other studies. And we kind of took this concept of moderate to vigorous physical activity. We can quantify that fairly easy with um, wrist-worn actigraphy. And so with um, the, the patients that we enrolled, within the first couple of uh, weeks of their concussion, we followed them until their symptoms went away. We had them wear, wear like a wristwatch that quantified how much moderate to vigorous physical activity there was. And the World Health Organization suggests that adolescents at large should get about 30 minutes a day or about 150 minutes a week um, of moderate to vigorous physical activity. So above kind of a light jog to where you're breathing hard, um, kind of a, a pretty easily understood patient goal. And we found that the people who uh, uh, exercise that MVPA above 30 minutes a day, back to that 150 minutes a week, 160 minutes a week that we're working with, um, they had a faster symptom recovery than people who were under that level on a consistent basis. So that's just symptom resolution, right? So that's asking 20 different symptoms, zero to six, how severe are, are those symptoms? But then when we think about mental health as a distinct element that also manifests post-concussion, there are associations between, and I, I think you could read media pieces that say, you know, you get a concussion, you're going to have poor mental health outcomes. Well, maybe, and, and I have a lot of other data that supports that um, it's not that simple, as I was saying earlier. But the good news here is we have a modifiable intervention that we know independent of a concussion, those who exercise more have less anxiety and less depressive symptoms. Post-concussion, people who are maybe vulnerable to anxiety and, and increased depressive symptoms, those who uh, exercise more than 30 minutes a day uh, or a half an hour of, of moderate to vigorous physical activity had no um, kind of clinically significant anxiety or depressive symptoms relative to those who did not exercise as much. Now, you might ask, well, it's kind of a cause and effect. There's, there's, it's hard to establish causality here because the people with more anxiety may be less likely to exercise or the people who are exercising may be more likely to have uh, less anxiety. We're still not sure of that cause and effect relationship, but at least demonstrating a real clear, tangible goal for that patient who may be prone to anxiety, for example. And I think most of you that treat patients know that kind of perhaps the type A person that um, you worry about early on developing um, kind of these severe secondary symptoms such as anxiety, um, exercise a consistent prescription for regular exercise at a, at a high intensity level um, is a place to start. Now, this is a, this is a really cool um, analysis that takes the same kind of data and essentially tells us not all physical activity is equal. And this is done by Matthew Wingerson, a PhD student with ours. And through some regression modeling um, that I don't need to get in here uh, uh, in too deep in the weeds today, I don't think, unless anybody wants me to, um, if you essentially this, this is, it's called a substitution analysis where you can replace, you can model the relationship between variables by replacing one activity for another. So if you took 10 minutes of sedentary behavior sitting on a couch and you replaced it with 10 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity during concussion recovery, the model estimates suggest that you would have a six and a half day decrease in symptom resolution time and you return to sports five days sooner. So that's cool, right? So you change out just sitting for doing something. But even cooler, I think, is that if you replace 10 minutes of uh, light activity with 10 minutes of MVPA, then your, your symptoms got better six days sooner and you return to play four and a half days sooner. So it's not just getting off the couch and doing something. It's getting off the couch doing something at a high level that creates that treatment response effect that I think we're honing in on that's very, very valuable for patients in that post-concussion uh, recovery phase of not just, I mean, I think, again, stepping back to the patient that's going to be not doing much, doing something is better than doing nothing. Don't get me wrong. But getting that person to a higher level earlier on could also help facilitate their, their healing time and ultimately their return to play time. Now, also thinking about physical activity, what are the barriers to physical activity, right? So I think some obvious ones would be like access to gym equipment or a treadmill or a stationary bike, um, you know, and we haven't quite studied this too well as far as um, uh, modalities go, but one other potential barrier to physical activity that we've identified is your symptoms, right? And so this is done by, by Kate Smulligan, who is a, a PhD student of ours as well. 
she found that those with more dizziness early on post-concussion over the subsequent two weeks of monitoring had less physical activity, right? So kind of a, maybe a little bit of a no-duh, David, type of uh, <laughs> uh, conclusion that if you're dizzy, you probably don't feel up to going out and going for a jog, right? But what do we do about that clinically? Well, assessing those types of things, these types of symptom or self-limiting barriers could help us understand, well, if we can help treat the dizziness, then we could help get them back physically active sooner post-concussion, and then maybe they wouldn't be as sedentary for as long and not develop these secondary symptoms as well. And so thinking about how we identify uh, barriers, both um, symptom-wise, but also I think more globally as far as access to to various uh, treatment guidelines and, and, and uh, equipment um, may be another route to help getting people better sooner. And then the last thing that I wanna talk about is the relationship between sleep and exercise, right? So in any study, you put sleep in the middle of it and it kind of blows everything up because sleep is so central to everything we do as mammals, quite honestly. You see that uh, uh, post-concussion, we actually have quantified through the kind of a, a, a a very established scoring system, sleep quality index, that adolescents sleep worse after their concussion than, than controls. Not super shocking. Um, even when you adjust for age, sex, concussion history, and anxiety or depression history, those were diagnostically useful values. And so I think that that's the starting point. Okay, so sleep is affected by a concussion. I think sleep, again, those of you that are suffering from maybe some, some sleep deficits yourself right now, due to family obligations or studying too much, um, you see it, right? You get cognitively foggy, very similar to post-concussion. But we also see that exercise and sleep interact in a bi-directional manner. And so um, what you see on the, on the left here, visit one, we assess sleep quality, and then we stratified people by how much exercise they did before visit two, which was about a month later. And the people, uh, so, so no uh, differences at baseline. But then the people who uh, exercise more than 150 minutes a week, when they came back, they were sleeping better over that month than the people who weren't. And if you look at the, the change value, essentially on the left there, the people who are the high aerobic exercisers, they, um, they improved by about five points on, the, on this scale, which is clinically significant, versus one point for the group that didn't. And then the other kind of two things that I think are worth pointing out is that you can kind of categorize people, this is based on chart review data on the left here, as reporting good sleep and exercising post-concussion, good sleep and not exercising, poor sleep and exercising, poor sleep and not exercising. And what our chart review data of, of hundreds of patients that we've seen in our clinics at Children's Hospital Colorado show is that if you're exercising and you're sleeping well, you recover faster than people that uh, exhibit one or neither of those behaviors. So um, again, I think as we think about post-concussion care, I, I'm showing you a lot of data that essentially says good, healthy lifestyle factors and behaviors post-concussion are gonna help that person sleep or uh, recover sooner. And, and honestly, probably for the rest of us, if you're physically active and you sleep uh, well, then, then that's gonna benefit other areas of your life. The, the other thing that I was gonna point out is that there seems to be a time dependent relationship here too. And I, I don't wanna get too bogged in the weeds here either, but we quantify how much somebody spends in bed awake at night via wrist-worn actigraphy um, and how much MVPA they're doing. And what we're seeing is that the people who don't sleep well early on tend to exercise less post-concussion in that subsequent week whereas the inverse is not true. So early physical activity doesn't necessarily lead to better sleep, but better sleep does lead to more physical activity. So encouraging good sleep habits early post-concussion could kind of unlock a host of other beneficial things for that patient. So I think the clinical takeaways I hope that I've convinced you of is, is think beyond just exercise. So if you just tell a patient to exercise, uh, that may not be doing that person the best favors because it's gonna be hard for them to understand all of the nuances that I've just described. Um, understanding their adherence and their potential barriers and motivations, like what are they doing in real life is very important to understand. Thinking about the role of sleep and how that influences exercise and how those two in combination could affect the, the total outcome of that patient, I think are important. And then thinking about feasibility, accessibility, the clinical goals and the dose that you're recommending or should all be top of mind as you're thinking about post-concussion exercise. All right, 
let's move along the spectrum a little bit. So we've, we have the patient and, and we've gotten them into a good exercise routine. They're sleeping well. What are some methods maybe beyond what we traditionally think about uh, when it comes to recovery monitoring? And so I don't know what you all use um, to, to determine whether or not an athlete should go back to play. Um, I think that there's a set of very baseline or, or fundamental tools that a lot of people use. Um, but we have a little bit of a, a, a conflict here, I think, based on, again, existing evidence. So on the left, we have the SCAT-6, we have computerized neurocognitive testing, we have balanced error scoring system. Um, these are what I would call clinically feasible and useful, in some cases, to, to varying degrees and opinions, um, tools that, that people use post-concussion. Uh, the study... Uh, several years ago, apologies, um, showed that of all of these kind of traditionally or commonly used concussion tools, they have less than optimal reliability. Not a ringing endorsement for these, right? If you're going to test something and you're going to rely on that to tell you whether or not somebody's recovering and you don't know what is test retest variability versus true recovery, that's problematic for a lot of reasons. Now, on the right, we have these super sophisticated physiological measures that tell us all sorts of information about underlying physiology, from neuroimaging to fluid biomarkers, genetic testing, emerging technologies. They're valuable research tools, but how many of you in your usual standard of care are gonna hook somebody up to an EEG, high density electrode, understand what any of that means, analyze it in a way that actually is useful within the moment um, for that patient in front of you? Probably nobody. Um, and so I think that there's this kind of disconnect of what do we sacrifice as far as clinical feasibility for more rigorous physiologically based testing, but not at the expense of, of the clinician. Um, and, and quite honestly, the, the ability to give information to the patient and their family in real time. So this is a lot of the work that really kind of this, this line of thinking stemmed for a lot of the work that I've done in dual tasking. And so you can measure motor function on the left. You can measure with great precision um, uh, gait performance, right? Whatever measure you want. I know that there are biomechanics labs here on campus and, and, uh, and, they're, and they're fantastic to measure how somebody's moving through space. And as I mentioned on the, on the left here, we have uh, co computerized cognitive tasks, right? So we can measure reaction time and memory and all that, very validated. Um, used throughout a lot of different areas um, in concussion and beyond. But what happens when you actually ask somebody to do both of those two things at the same time? And, and I think that the, the kind of uh, the theory is that we're getting more toward a sport-like setting, right? So anybody who plays sports um, is, uh, is not going to be focused on one single thing. And, and I, I typically use an example of like passing a ball you know, on the soccer pitch, right? So you have to think about where you are, where your plant leg's going, how are you going to kick the ball? I don't play soccer, so I don't know exactly how spin works and all that kind of stuff. But where your teammate is, where the opponents are, right? It's a very cognitive process that you have to uh, anticipate all of these things in real time, right? In neural time, we're talking milliseconds. Um, and you have to have the motor flexibility and adaptability to actually execute that movement, right? And so while going from just a simple gait test to that environment, the dual test does not reflect that. It at least starts to get toward how do you synthesize information in real time and do two things at once, quite honestly. And, and our brain is not able to truly do uh, uh, multitask, as we call it. It's, it's actually rapid task switching. So how effectively can you switch between one thing or the other as you're trying to execute them at the same time? So in the, in the world of kind of gait analysis and, and dual task motor and cognitive abilities, we have kind of this paradigm where we're thinking about how sophisticated do we want to be and how accurate do we want to be on the left, but that also comes at a high cost and time demand all the way down to the right, as I'll show you, with kind of lower cost, lower time, but you're, you're sacrificing some accuracy and some objectivity with that. And so you have a motion analysis here at the, the University of Oregon uh, where I did my PhD, all, all the like uh, rec gymnasium that was transformed into a, a motion analysis lab is great for the things that we wanted to do, but not everybody has access to this space, let alone hundreds of thousands of dollars for the equipment, let alone the expertise to analyze uh, and interpret in real time. So we scale that down to wearable technology. So there's plenty of commercially available sensor uh, companies that can quantify some kind of human movement 
um, whether that's through um, like putting a, a, a sensor on the lumbar spine and on either foot. Um, and that's a lot of the work that we've done. But then that still comes at a cost. Those things are, I don't know, five to $15,000, depending on how expensive and, and sophisticated you want to get, which for a lot of people, that's not an option. So what we've been working on um, over the last several years is a collaborator of ours um, who is an app development specialist trying to put a research grade tool into the, into the palm of everybody's hand that has a smartphone to actually quantify movement in real time in the, in the kind of confines of a sports medicine clinic that can be done um, within just a couple of minutes. And then we have something like the tandem gait test, which is just a simple strip of fabric and a stopwatch is all you need walk down and back several times, time how long it takes them to do that. And then even more kind of rudimentary would be something like the Romberg test. Just stand there, close your eyes and see what happens. Um, and so you can see there's kind of advantages and disadvantages of each of these approaches. So with uh, kind of what, where we started, and again, this is, this is old, old videos at this point, um, was dual task dysfunction um, after concussion. On the left, you can see um, uh, this is a 14 year old boy, a couple days after a concussion, he's asked to walk and subtract numbers by sevens, um, from a hundred. And you can see that as he starts doing that, it kind of destabilizes him to the point where he's kind of no longer walking in a straight line. And we can see that, that, that induction of that destabilization to the system, whereas the healthy control is able to navigate those two tasks at the same time fairly easily. And so there's a bunch of uh, uh, reviews that have now been written on this. So we're not the only ones that have studied this. There's a lot of other groups that have quantified various elements of movement that are affected either under single task or dual task conditions. Go ahead and look up any of these. They all provide kind of the same conclusion, which is you can measure movement deficits longer post-concussion than um, people report symptom recovery. So people say their symptoms get better, great. And then down the road, uh, their, um, their, their gait is still affected in some way. But again, back to what do we do with this, right? So I'm getting to that, I promise. But I gave this, I've given this talk several times, you know, uh, over, the, over the years and kind of end it here. Like, hey, you, you know, you, you have gait disruptions, post-concussion, good luck to you, right? So that's maybe not where we want to end. Um, I've certainly learned that. Um, and so then we take that kind of dual task concept into, um, a tandem gate task, right? So something that you can no longer need like the sophistication of a, a motion analysis laboratory, but instead you can ask the patient to walk down and back three meters, heel the toe as fast as they can, turn around and come back. And then you can ask them to do the same thing, but measure how well they spell words backwards, for example. And so you can actually quantify within the individual how much time is there between conditions. And so for somebody with a concussion, maybe it takes them 15 seconds to complete the dual task or the single task tandem gate, but 30 seconds because of that added cognitive load to do the dual task tandem gate versus, you know, somebody with the same time without a concussion as a single task, maybe they only, they only go five seconds slower uh, under dual task. So you almost have a within individual uh, comparison that you can see what the effect of that kind of cognitive load or cognitive perturbation is. And so using that, we, uh, again, from our, from our uh, pediatric sports medicine concussion clinics, we tested a year's worth of data, a year's worth of patients that came in, and we found that both in single and dual task assessments, those with concussion were slower than those without. Shocking, I know. Um, but I think that this is where we need to go next. It's like, okay, for that person who's seen a patient and has them, dual, has them do the tandem gait test, what are the cutoffs that might be meaningful, that might guide you to say, hey, this is actually uh, somewhat influenced or, or affected? And so we've come up with a couple of reasonable thresholds. You can see 88% sensitive, 72% specific for the single task tool that uh, tandem gate test time, it's a mouthful, um, at 16 seconds. So anything slower than 16 seconds in this population of adolescents with a sport-related concussion in the last two weeks, um, that was kind of the best cutoff. And same thing in dual task, but a little bit slower, 22 seconds. So these can kind of hopefully guide a little bit about how fast somebody should be performing and where you start to draw the line of this is kind of clinically significant or not. And, and you can see in the SCAT 6, um, and I believe in the SCOT 6, um, they, the, these instructions are here. And this is largely derived from, uh, again, one of our PhD students' papers, Matthew Wingerson, 
who really kind of outlined um, this protocol. So happy to talk through any of those things as, as you all want. I could talk for hours about that. And then I also wanted to point out one other interesting thing that we just have started working on here in the last couple of years that's led by Kate Smulligan um, is the concept of, so we kind of go on head to toe or toe to head, um, cervical spine proprioception. So uh, at the end of the day, there's a lot of overlap between concussion and whiplash. And from the, so we're kind of borrowing from the whiplash literature from the PT world that this is a commonly used test of cervical spine proprioception. So you have somebody um, uh, forehead and they get at the middle of the target, look away each direction, uh, left and right, and then uh, flexion and extension, and then close their eyes and try to kind of recreate how close they can get to that center with, with their eyes closed. And so here's some example data from a patient um, you can see how close they got in flexion, left, right, and extension. And so for each of those, you calculate the, the centimeters for each trial um, and then convert that to degrees and sum that all up. Um, and you can break it out by, by each area. All we've done thus far is, um, uh, again, kind of the overall deviation from that target with their eyes closed um, uh, as they try to come back toward the middle of that target. And we found that adolescents with concussion also have worse cervical spine proprioception than uninjured uh, adolescents. And so the AUC value, which is um, the area under the curve is 0.85. And for reference, that's in the similar ballpark as VOMS assessment, as the SCAT symptoms, our dual task tandem gait, and much, much better than the modified balance error scoring system test um, uh, when, when comparing concussion versus control patients. And so um, the other thing that we've tried to do is kind of challenge these established norms. So this whole target is built, that green and yellow area is built around a 4.5 degree deviation from the middle. And what we found is that actually in adolescents with concussion, it's 3.5 degrees is the optimal cut point. Um, and, and again, you're seeing the difference of kind of some of these commonly accepted um, areas of dysfunction or cut, clinical cutoffs this 4.5 degree number is in all of the PT clinical literature, um, at least what I'm told, I'm not a PT, um, and, and what, what a lot of PTs are taught, and it comes from adults with neck pain. So how do adults with neck pain function relative to adolescents with concussion? So all this to say is that um, uh, dual task paradigms, I think, can be useful for this sport-like performance in a controlled environment. Um, thinking about clinical implementation, using these cut points to guide, and then thinking about neck proprioception as well, which I'll, I'll come to here in a little bit. So I'm not going to end there. Stick with me. One more objective here. And this is like, okay, so we do all of these assessments and we say there are differences or there's not, or there's a deficit for this patient. And if we end the story there, that's also very challenging uh, for that patient or for you as a clinician to say, hey, David, what do I actually do with this information? So that's where I'm going here is the intervention piece as a part of return to play. So... For those of you that don't know, there is a wide variety of studies that now exist that show if you get a concussion and you go back to sports, whether you're high school, collegiate, adult, or professional, you are anywhere between two and three times more likely to get a lower extremity musculoskeletal injury than somebody who has not had a concussion. And that's what this table shows. So a lot of different designs, monitoring periods, types of groups, sample sizes. I will point out this literature is incredibly biased toward male athletes. 87% of the, the data represented on this table is, is male athletes. And so we're still trying to understand um, kind of some of the nuances, but I think the general thinking here is that if you go back from a concussion based on the existing kind of uh, return to play metrics, if you go back to sports, um, perhaps there are subtle subclinical physiological deficits that manifest as X, Y, or Z, we don't really know, but they relate to a increased risk of an injury in that year after you play, uh, after you go back to sports. So we're kind of searching for, well, what measures are actually gonna help us predict musculoskeletal injury after concussion? Uh, a group out of Delaware a couple of years ago looked at all of kind of our common signs or uh, common assessments, including BESS and, and impact or, or neurocognitive testing, um, reaction time, King Devic, uh, visual testing, found none, none of them predict future injury risk. And so I think that that kind of helped us in our thinking of future injury risk prediction is never linear. It's not binary and it's not simple. So it's not just a yes or no. And there's a lot of things to consider, right? 
So if you have an athlete and uh, so, so first of all, if you have an athlete and you're clearing them to go back to sports, don't tell them, Hey, you're at higher risk of an ankle sprain or an ACL sprain. Good luck. Uh, uh, I'll see you in a couple of weeks when you show back up in my clinic, right? That's not a good message, but I do think that you want to understand all of these different potential factors that may also influence injury risk that may have influenced them getting a concussion in the first place. So previous injuries, types of injuries, whether they're like a risk taker or aggressive, um, uh, fear avoidance, uh, attentional disruptions, as I've touched on, what actually happened during their concussion, types of sports, exposure, all those things. This is like just a tip of the iceberg of all the potential things. And so what are some factors that may predict future injury risk. So if we think back to the dual task concept, uh, uh, kind of cognitive perturbation, asking somebody to do two things at once, that may, based on this study by, by Jesse Oldham, um, who's at Virginia Commonwealth now, um, we, we do see an effect for dual task gait speed. So how fast somebody walks under this dual task condition, um, that was related to a higher incidence of lower extremity musculoskeletal injury in the, in the following year. Back to our laser headlamp test, um, uh, this is new information that, that we just kind of analyzed in the last couple of months. Um, what we found is that not the initial, so like the first two weeks, the head repositioning accuracy is what this is called. So how closely they can realign with their eyes closed to the center of that target. Um, worse uh, cervical spine proprioception at return to play. So when they were cleared to return to play and we assessed their cervical spine proprioception, the worse that it was, the higher odds that that person was going to go and um, uh, sustain an injury over the next year. And then finally, the other thing that we've honed in on for predicting this is just a simple reaction time. So this is a, a, a kind of a sub part of the app that I was mentioning. So it's a red dot, then it turns green, and you press it. And it quantifies how long it takes you to recognize that it turned green and, and to press it. You do 30 trials, you take the average of that. And we see that the rate of those who uh, sustained a, a subsequent injury um, kind of at this threshold of about 500 milliseconds was significantly higher, about three times higher in the slow reaction time once they were cleared to return to sports. So three things to potentially consider, dual task function, reaction time, and neck proprioception that I think aren't maybe on the radar of uh, uh, most or, or some uh, sports medicine clinicians. So this is the what can we do about it. So this is the, the Van Mechelen Wheel of Injury Prevention. Came out in the 90s. If you're not familiar with it, there's kind of a four-step process that's cyclical with any sort of intervention. Number one, what is the extent of the problem? I kind of already outlined that. Maybe two to three times greater risk of subsequent uh, lower extremity musculoskeletal injury plus concussion. Then what are the mechanisms? And so we don't fully know, but I would say something to do with neuromuscular um, coordination or, or, or function largely. So then what do we actually do about that? How do we intervene um, on this sort of um, kind of line of thinking? And so there are injury prevention programs that exist, luckily, in the largely out of the, the soccer literature, but well-established methods that help reduce injury rates in youth athletes, uh, soccer, basketball, um, ankle sprains, uh, you name it. They're relatively simple to administer, and they rely on plyometrics, strength, technique training, balance training, and, and the overall goal is neuromuscular system uh, adaptations. So this is, excuse me, uh, so this is the study design that we did. We'll have a couple of primary analyses on this, and, and then I'll wrap up. So we had people come in, enrolled them, did a bunch of measurements. We waited until they got uh, cleared to go back to sports. Once they were cleared to go back to sports, we randomly assigned them to a neuromuscular training intervention or standard of care. And then we followed them for the next year. We sent out surveys every month and we asked, did you get injured? How many, how many sports did you play? How much sports, how many hours of sports did you play? Practices, games, et cetera. And we theorized that if you did a, if you did this program, this neuromuscular training program, you would have a lower uh, injury risk than those who didn't, largely because if you're already vulnerable to uh, an injury and you do something that's well established, we kind of theorized that that would work. And what we found was that absolutely, yeah, a small sample. So um, I think we had 12 in the intervention group and 16 in the standard of care group, but we followed them for a year with really good adherence. And what we found was that in the intervention group, 36% of the, the participants sustained a sport-related musculoskeletal injury in the following year, whereas 75% of the people in the standard of care 
uh, group sustained a sport-related musculoskeletal injury. So that translated to a, a hazard ratio or increased risk of about three and a half times for those that were in the standard of care group. So there is something that we can do about this and it's relatively easy to administer. Interestingly, we found that the injury occurrence was most common during that intervention period. So um, whether there's some sort of like prophylactic effect in right at the time of, of return to play um, without a long lasting kind of benefit, we're not exactly sure. Um, and there is some evidence to support that, again, back to this concept of dosing, the more you do, the more effective it becomes. And then secondarily, we also looked at this concept of reaction time and found that the, the neuromuscular training intervention actually helped uh, with improving reaction time um, at that post-intervention visit relative to standard of care. So there's something between reaction time predicting being intervened upon through this program um, and helping mitigate risk of injury over that next year. So um, as far as the next steps, I think that in-person kind of care is probably the gold standard, but we also recognize that not everybody has access to an athletic trainer or a sports medicine physician or a PT on a regular basis. And so what we're working with, um, funded by the DOD, because I think that they're also interested in kind of military applications when you can't be physically next to the person, is putting this kind of virtual neuromuscular training program into an app that people can download, go through kind of all of the various equipment elements and the exercises, and it, it'll help guide people both with video and written instruction. So um, to wrap up this, I think those three things are what our data have shown um, are probably the most thus far important things to hone in on during that return to play process and then into designing a return to play rehab program for that person, both at return to play and perhaps beyond, um, these are neuromuscular training programs can be feasibly implemented as a part of, uh, of these protocols. Um, obviously pros and cons exist for in-person versus virtual, um, but uh, uh, happy to discuss that uh, as well. So clinical takeaways, I'm gonna wrap it up. This is my last slide. Aerobic exercise, volume and intensity, so the dose of exercise should be individualized to the person and think about adherence. How are you meeting them where they're at to get them to do something after their injury? Second, thinking through the whole body uh, from, from dual task, kind of cognitive perturbations, motor function, cervical spine, reaction time, all of those things might provide insights into both clinical recovery, but also future injury risk. And then once people actually go back to sports, thinking about how we can help guide them in ways that um, uh, rehabilitate or treat the areas that potentially could be disrupted for a prolonged period, even after return to play clearance, based on our kind of clinical uh, studies is, is something to, to consider there. So um, these are the funding sources. These are the people that make it work. This is our campus. And again, pleasure to be here. Thanks for listening to me and excited for a little bit more panel discussion from here. Thank you. Before we move into the panel discussion, we have time for questions for Dr. Hal from the audience. And I would just ask again, you wait for the microphone to make its way to you before you ask your question. And uh, they've gone through progressions, and they may be uh, challenged against their baseline testing if they do that. Are you, any of your physicians making them do any of the dual gate stuff or any of the neurocognitive stuff? Like, what are they doing another step? Yeah, it's a good question. So, uh, to kind of rephrase, are you doing dual task kinds of assessments as an additional step to your standard of care? Um, I think it's dependent on the person, right? So. I think that there's probably some clear cut cases. Again, you tell me where you're like, yeah, you're definitely ready to go back or it's a little bit murkier. I think one example uh, in a recent discussion was an athlete who, um, you know, uh, him and, and his mom were in the room with the physician and they were trying to convince this, the physician, he's ready to go back, he's ready to go back. Um, based on all the standard tests, yeah, great, he, he looks good. 
but then you know he tries to walk a line and subtract by sevens from a hundred and he kind of falls off the line and i think that through that there was a little bit of education that happens you're less reliant on the specific time and the score or whatever um and more about like if you can't walk a line while subtracting good luck on the on the football field so i think that that's been really beneficial from a testing perspective um but would i ever say if you didn't get below a 22 second tandem gate time um, dual tasks, you should hold somebody out. Like, I think it's one piece of a much larger puzzle. And I think you try to enter, this is just kind of another, another element of that. It's a good question. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It was extraordinarily interesting. I'm very familiar with the circle and the head repositioning um, test. So thank you for doing that. Um, I am interested in you sharing stories about how you are working with an interdisciplinary team in order to return athletes to sports. These are very difficult conversations to have when you have a coach that really wants somebody to return to the field. You have an athletic trainer who's just worried about the overall holistic health of their athlete. And then you have an athlete that wants to go back to the field. And now you don't have necessarily this hard line um, to talk through like, hey, you're not at 22 seconds, so you can't go back. But so I'm just curious if you could share how those conversations are going when you think about the coach and the athletic trainer and the athlete and the parents and about their inability to be ready to return and or their ability to be ready to return based upon the test that you're outlining here. Yeah, it's, it's uh, another great question. I think, um, as I mentioned, trying to piece together all of the data for that patient and and describe it to them from a um, both a short-term and a long-term health perspective. Like, like I said, you know, um, probably not best to induce nocebo effects, so to speak, where, um, you know, you say, Hey, you're, if you go back to sports, you're definitely going to get injured. Right. I don't think that that's the right message, but trying to sit to, to say, Hey, your brain is still recovering and here's the evidence to why. Right. And so this is one piece of it. Um, again, if you can show some of that, like neck proprioception, potentially, and you can show that the reaction time is slower. I think that that's what we're trying to say is uh, is this integrated piece of, it's not, and it, uh, yeah, so so those are the testing parts. But then I think that the other part is the conversation with the family. Um, and and we're, I'm, I'm very much coming from a, a sports medicine clinic perspective, right? So these are people that are two weeks, three weeks, four weeks post-concussion um, and, and largely removed from the coach. I think the challenge is for the athletic trainers that are embedded within uh, an athletic department, and they are talking to the coach who really wants their athlete to get back onto the field and helping them understand, um, you know, again, I, I'm a scientist, so I'm probably biased in how I think about this, but like data speaks. And if you can say, hey, here are three or two different elements that say this is not quite back to where it needs to be um, based on, you know, what we know about normative data um, if they have a baseline, that's great, but that's a different discussion about challenges with baseline testing and administration and interpretation. Um, I think piecing all of those things together to to then bring a cohesive message, right, to, to that coach and say, yes, I don't want them to go back to sports right now, but these are the reasons why. I think that that's, that's the best approach that, that we've come up with. Really quick question. Nice job. Um, you talked about the importance of good sleep. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that's easier said than done, right? Do you recommend using things like melatonin or other types of um, assistive, you know, whether it be mind space or things like that? Great, great question. So a um, uh, lot of thoughts, and I probably could give a whole another hour lecture on, on post-concussion sleep. So number one is uh, based on our, we did a chart review of all the patients that we saw a couple years ago. And the one we, we didn't have good adherence data, but the ones who we prescribed melatonin to had no clinically significant difference in how long it took them to recover, their symptoms, uh, severity, um, kind of a weak study design, but at least showed melatonin is not really doing a whole lot. I think that for an individual patient, it probably could, but there's really no evidence to say every patient should get melatonin post-concussion. I think it's a very uh, individualized decision. I don't know that there's a ton of harm. Um, but supplements in general, I'm just a little bit wary of, um, as far as what you tell the patient, I think that you're hitting on something really, really important is that 
there are no good guidelines for post-concussion sleep. I think most people say sleep hygiene, um, which I don't, I don't like that terminology because it makes it sound like, like there's something dirty with sleep and I need to clean it. Like, I don't know. There's, there's some sort of weird terminology thing there that I don't fully understand. And so, um, Hope, I mean, we're, we're working on uh, ways to get an intervention funded with one of our sleep psychologists. I think some of the key areas that we've honed in on is um, extending time in bed to allow for more sleep. Um, and I think especially with the adolescent, adolescent population, um, reducing reliance on screens, so phones and things like that. I think, again, probably most of us know, like, don't lay in bed scrolling on your phone right before you go to bed. That's going to disrupt all sorts of other things. Um, concussion or otherwise to your circadian rhythm. Um, and then I think, uh, I mean, guilty as charged. I'm, 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 I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, and then I think the other two things are anxiety management. I think particularly post-concussion, but it could be related to um, any, any, any sort of, uh, well, just living life, is laying in bed, experiencing some sort of extended period of wakefulness and kind of that experience of your mind spinning. And um, especially if you've had a recent injury, um, that can be a, a, a time where you're prone to enhanced or increased anxiety. Um, and then I think the other thing that we found in on is, is sleep-wake uh, consistency. So I think one of the things that can disrupt a circadian rhythm is going to bed on the weekends way later and sleeping in, and then during the week, going to bed a little bit earlier and waking up early. And so especially post-concussion, trying to enhance the ability for people to know if you go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time every day, that's going to help regulate your circadian rhythm. Um, by doing that, then you're going to, and again, sorry, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but by doing that, you're, you're going to um, enhance your, your brain's ability to, to reduce the metabolic waste that is built up due to the injury and just by living life. Um, and that really only happens uh, during deep sleep. And so trying to just facilitate that environment for that person to sleep well and get away from those myths that still I think are in TV shows and movies of, oh, so-and-so got a concussion. I need to wake them up every hour, right? Like good sleep after concussion is the best thing that somebody can do. So really good question um, and happy to come back in a few years and, and hopefully we'll have some trial results that show the efficacy of an intervention there. I'm going to occupy all your time. Perfect. I, I'm oh, just good. curious. You've mentioned the DOD um, several times, and I know that you're primarily within the adolescent population. Um, but is there uh, any information that you can share regarding the reason the person sustained the concussion? So I'm just thinking about the um, the people that I've been working with. Some of my colleagues they work directly with soldiers that have traumatic concussions based upon you know IEDs, et cetera. So really dramatic. Um, experiences. And I'm just curious if there is any difference in your research or have you known of any of somebody who sustains an, a very traumatic concussion secondary to IED as an example versus someone who um, gets a concussion in a different way like via sport or something like that? Yeah. So there's, there's again, a lot to unpack there. So great, great question. So I think fundamentally, like the, the physics of a blast injury and how your brain responds to that versus a uh, concussion that occurs during sport where you're hit and there's a traumatic kind of impulse to your brain and it, you know, there's the rotational, uh, acceleration, uh, that causes all sorts of like neuronal depolarization and disruption. Um, those are kind of fundamentally very different, uh, yeah, physics, I guess. Uh, I don't know as much about the blast literature, um, myself, but there are a lot of parallels between the two. Um, but, but certainly some differences as well. I think in, in the military context, the other challenge is the trauma of the event, right? War, we'll use as an example um, of, you know, somebody who is very upset about, um, you know, sustaining a concussion on the football field as a 14-year-old, you know, JV football team. Like, that's, that's a big deal. But it's, it's very different uh, as far as the, the uh, psychological response relative to somebody that is also seeing the kind of the, the other parts, uh, you know, of the battlefield. And so I think that what we're trying to do is create these tools that are accessible for clinicians to, that are, you know, PTs, for example, that are embedded in units that maybe aren't out on the, on the front lines, but should something happen that they would have kind of an immediate way to communicate back with the, with a clinician and, and get kind of objective validated data that tells you something about you know, what, like the stakes are, right? So the stakes uh, in, in the military setting 
of removal uh, from duty are much different as far as reaction time goes and decision making than than on the sports pitch as well. So I think that there's there's certainly some parallels, um, but but quite a few differences. Um, and uh, and yeah, so we're we're working toward that uh, over the coming years, and, and we're working with Brook Army Medical Center as well. Um, who's doing a similar type of approach of a lot of the data that we've done, but with active duty soldiers right now too. So more to come. Thanks. Any other questions for Dr. Howe? All right, well, thank you, Great. Dr. Howe. Thank you. Another round of applause, please. All right, we will now move to the panel discussion portion of the presentation. So if our panelists could please make their way to the stage. And I'll invite our IOTA Tau Alpha leadership team up to introduce them individually. Um, and we're also honored to have the panel moderated by our very own Dr. Kitty Newsham, core faculty member of the SLU Athletic Training Program. First up, we have Dr. Jamil Nimi. He is a sports medicine physician and assistant professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at St. Louis University School of Medicine. After growing up in the Detroit area, he graduated um, from undergrad and his medical degree from Creighton University. Afterwards, he completed residency in family medicine at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, where he also served as chief resident. Then he completed a fellowship in primary care sports medicine at St. Vincent Alahani Health. He serves as medical director for the SLU Masters of Athletic Training Program and co-medical director for SSM Health Sports Medicine, as well as team physician for the St. Louis Sabres, St. Louis University, UMSL, Missouri Baptist University, Harris Stowe University, and Fontbonne University. His professional areas of interest include sports medicine, preventative medicine, and community health awareness. He enjoys cooking, playing basketball, and is an avid Detroit sports fan. All right, next up we have Becca Steins. Becca Steins is the Assistant Director of SLU Sports Psychology and is currently a doctoral student in the Clinical Psychology Program at SLU. She is originally from St. Louis. After completing undergrad at Drury University, she went on to receive her MA in kinesiology with an emphasis in sports psychology at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, where she, her research centered on the psychological impact of concussions on women athletes. Now in her third year at SLU, her dissertation consists of developing a feminist intervention for injured women athletes, specifically exploring the role of gender to improve mental health outcomes and promote self-compassion, resiliency, and sport injury-related growth during the injury recovery process. In her role as Assistant Director of Sports Psychology, Becca also works in collaboration with the sports medicine team to provide interdisciplinary care to injured athletes. She also conducts trainings and workshops for athletic community partners and local athletic trainers on the psychology of injury. Her additional research interests in clinical specialties include body image and eating disorders in sport and multicultural and feminist practices in sports psychology. All right, and last but not least, we have Scott Kugler, who is a native of St. Louis. Scott became interested in sports medicine in high school. He was originally a PT major at the University of Missouri-Columbia, um, but he was intrigued by the athletic training profession as his classmates were working alongside the sidelines of Mizzou practices and games and quickly switched his major. Upon graduation, he earned the James Baker Award for Best Student Clinician. Regarding his career, Scott jokes that it has gone in reverse order. He was blessed to work with the Arizona Cardinals and New York Jets organizations before taking a position with the NFL Europe League with the Berlin Thunder. In 2007, he returned to St. Louis, and while out, of, while out at a bar in St. Charles, he learned about an athletic training position at Shamrod High School, which he still serves today. In 2013, he took on the task of teaching anatomy and physiology classes, and in 2019, he became assistant athletic director. He states that working in the secondary school setting has been the most challenging and rewarding time of his career. The friendships that he has formed with the student athletes lead to Shamanad being a clinical site for SLU athletic training program. 
who is now my preceptor right now. Um, and lastly, Scott's main goal each day is to see how fast he can get home to his wife and his four-year-old son. In his free time, he loves to travel and so much that he became a travel agent. Thank you. Well, thanks for that presentation and um, appreciate the panel being here. We'll I'll throw some questions out and um, you can just you can decide who's going to weigh in first here. Um, I'm going to start looking at uh, we talked a bit about anxiety. And so wondering if anyone is screening at baseline with your student athletes or patient population. Um, and then when are you identifying this post concussion? Uh, so I routinely uh, uh, will uh, screen for that with every concussion. I mean, we do in the clinic anyways, we end up doing a PHQ too. And then everybody that comes in, part of our symptom screening is uh, includes a mood section. So are you having any, any increased uh, irritability, uh, depression, uh, mood liability? Um, so we, we do kind of cover that initially. One thing that we are really blessed with at our school is that I work really closely with our school counselors. And one thing that we've been doing over the past few years, especially with COVID, is uh, screening all of them. We screen all of our guys. It is totally anonymous um, until they want to come in and start to say, hey, they want to sit down with a counselor. The part that we haven't gone to so far yet is in, in works is to cross-reference those guys when they do have a concussion to see if they're one of these guys that has been flagged with anxiety, depression, some kind of uh, disorder. Uh, that's something that I'm really intrigued with, uh, especially when we work uh, with our, our school counselors. So I guess I can talk right from the perspective of, you know, usually the athletes who come to us might already have anxiety, right? Especially after injury. And one of the things that we're doing here at SLU um, and we're really trying to implement this upcoming year is doing baseline screening on mood related disorders for all athletes. Um, so let's say they become injured, we're able to take that baseline right then, um, have that original data, compare it, and then, you know, the role of the sports psychologist then comes to kind of monitor that and take those kind of routine outcome measures um, of that anxiety over time and see what kind of interventions we can use to um, kind of alleviate those symptoms in whatever individualized area we can. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So uh, this is this is something we wrestle with uh, a lot, just in in athletes, particularly post concussion, but in general. Um, so post concussion, we know like whatever you bring into the injury is probably going to be exacerbated. So certainly anxiety. But when are you doing your baseline assessments, right? So if you're doing your baseline assessment during the summer, super optimistic, life is good. I just had a great summer vacation. I'm in the best shape of my life, you know. Versus six weeks, eight weeks later in the midst of midterms or finals coming up? And how do you disentangle injury effects from like just the, the rigors of being a person or being a, an undergraduate uh, student athlete at a, at a place like SLU? Like, how do you, how do you have that conversation? Cause I think that's really important to think about. Yeah, that's a really, that's a phenomenal point. That's something that um, we actually just sent out a survey to our student athletes two days ago, that's collecting some data, kind of mid-season data on mental health, substance use, sleep, all these different factors um, to kind of get an assessment of where SLU athletes are at right now. Um, data to come, we'll see. <laughs> um, but that's kind of a thought that we were having is like where along that timeline, right? We're asking all these athletes in different parts of their season. Some of, their, some of them are injured and we are asking the question if they're injured at the time. Um, but it does come down to like, is it the personality factors, temperament, all these, you know, pre-existing diagnoses? How do you temp? I would love to know what y'all are thinking. Cause from our perspective, I think it's, it does take individual conversations and like, you can't have individual conversations with every athlete. Mm -hmm. So we can chat later. <laughs> yeah. No, great point. I don't have any answers other than yeah. it's an I interesting mean, research question. We, we, uh, part of our incoming packet that we have, we, we do that screening too, but we're trying to figure out like what else we, we need to do something different because like you said, everybody comes in and very rarely do we have like, I, we have like a handful of people from a whole incoming class of athletes 
to actually screen anything but a zero <laughs> on on that. So there's like either they just either they're feeling great or they just have question fatigue because of all the the entire like thickness of that packet. And so we're trying to figure out something different. Yeah, one of the questions should be: Is this survey causing you anxiety? Right? Probably yes. <laughs> I'm wondering for, um, I'm going to point this one at you first, uh, Scott, about working with interdisciplinary teams um, for concussion recovery. Um, I, how, what advice would you have for somebody who is new to that uh, part of teamwork? Um, so a new a, a clinician working with a new team, perhaps a new healthcare team is what I'm alluding to there. At our school, it is imperative that you get to know their counselors, you get to know the nurse, you get to know their teachers. I am very fortunate I'm about 30 yards away from my main building, uh, and our counselors are wonderful, so I'll give them a lot of credit. Uh, our nurse, uh, our previous nurse, uh, she just retired, so I'm still working with this new one, uh, but she seems all on board. Everybody communicates. I think that's the biggest thing is the communication with everybody that's on that team. We all seen the diagram where the student is in the middle and then you have all these extensions off. All these guys have to talk to each other. Um, they have become very sneaky at times because one of them is you can't go back to you, one of the – you have to be asymptomatic and be full-time student before you can start to return to play. They now carry Tylenol and Advil in their bags. So they have become a little bit more sneaky, uh, but that's also where you have to call the, the parents as well. Uh, another good thing that's kind of come out through the, my entire profession is the, their classmates and their, their uh, teammates, they rat on them now. And that's been really good. You know, they, on them, so there's that confidentiality. But it is some, it is very important that the kids respect it and they know it. Even if it's little, they know that they can come to me and there is a little bit of that. Um, we that they care about their their their, their teammate. Um, we have this thing on Canvas. It's our learning management protocol. It's on a drop down detective. I can go each one of their teachers. I can see if this student is not turning in their work. I can see if their grades are slipping. I can go and I could talk to them. Hey, how do you, you know, how are these guys, how's the mood? I can walk through our cafeteria and see if they're physically engaged with their, their, their colleagues. Uh, all that is just more information for me. So uh, to kind of put all in a circle, it's very important to get to know everybody, top to bottom, counselors, teachers, your nurse, and even the kids, and just go through and be a part of their day and, and earn their trust. So how about the student athlete patient comes to your clinic, um, sees the, sees your team and you're working with a new athletic trainer. How do you, how do you, and I don't know if you're doing that communication. So I'd, I'd throw this to, to Dr. Nimi and Dr. Howell. How, how does that communication work with a brand new athletic trainer you've never communicated with? I, I, uh, I feel like it's, I, I feel like it's uh it's been the same all the time. Like speaking with an athletic trainer has been very consistent because it's they you know where they're coming from. They they uh they have their clinical duties and care of the athlete and they see that athlete all the time more than I do. Right. So my communication is is very similar whether regardless of the athletic trainer that I'm dealing with, which helps me a lot because then I don't have to like worry about what relationship that athletic trainer has with that with that athlete i know what like what role that they play and it's been very consistent as opposed to like i'm not dealing with a parent and that parent may want their kid to be forced back or that parent may not want their kid to go back right and so i have to like worry about those extra dynamics of things so it's been very consistent for me yeah and i think from like a like a policy level, uh, a lot of what, so we have our sports medicine physicians that work in the community with like 25 different high schools kind of around the Denver area and kind of that bi-directional communication, I think has been really important with athletic trainers of, uh, 
you know, we'll come up with some guidance on, you know, return to play language or steps of physical activity progression or something like that. And, and not just saying, this is what you need to do, but like having a place for each party to come together and say, okay, I see what you're getting at, but the patient and the parent don't. And when I'm telling them to, or the coach doesn't, and when I'm telling them to do X, Y, or Z, this is how they're interpreting it, but I have to sign off on this paper. I think part of that, like that circular feedback loop is really important because, you know, again, the physicians that, that I work with are, are in the, in the clinic and they're seeing patients on a one-on-one -on -one basis, whereas the athletic trainers in the community have to deal with a lot more parties and have to deal with a lot more, uh, potential areas of, of miscommunication. And so I think that refinement process, especially with the new, you know, guidelines that have come out in the last year, there's a lot of kind of trial and error that goes into that. So the athletic trainers have been really, really kind of paramount to that effort in, in our, in our area. I like that that bi-directional communication because it is it is a team approach and everybody has a has a different perspective. We all play a different role. So uh, thanks for that. I'm gonna loop back to sleep. I'm gonna call it sleep protocols. Okay. <laughs> and you do you all deal with different age populations. So I'm wondering what advice you have for um, secondary school versus college age versus older than that um what have you what have you found to be effective and uh I'll, yeah i'll leave it at that i'll circle back if there's if there's something out there yeah so i i uh i always start off at the basics so the, the sleep protocols and uh and then we kind of we talk about escalations from there so whether it's melatonin you know if, if you're having trouble falling asleep try the melatonin if you haven't yet see how that goes. I give a various like range of doses that you could try. If that doesn't work, then we start escalating things. So like I've used different medications depending, especially if we're dealing with uh, an older population or like not sport related concussion. But if I have somebody who has uh, headaches and sleep issues, I might try something like a, a TCA, like amitriptyline and nortriptyline because that extra side effect of uh, drowsiness is intended in this case. So so I just kind of like try to do that stepwise uh, progressions. Jonathan Charlu on Zoom says, for a student athlete thinking in terms of amount of rest recovery needed for the brain, is there any specific time period you suggest for reduced college high school course load or gauge it based on symptoms similar to return to play? I mean, I can, I can start at least on the academic engagement piece. Um, I don't know about the course load. I'm not an expert there, but I think what we're realizing over the last two or three years of emerging evidence uh, suggests that the more time out of school uh, that, that people like at least high school kids have post-concussion um, the, the greater the chance of kind of secondary sequelae happening, meaning like an increased anxiety uh, or, or depressive symptoms or things like that, um, as well as, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, overall recovery time. And so I think where we're moving, at least the evidence is pointing toward, and, and again, I think you guys probably have other experiences, um, is getting people back into class at least at some point sooner Post injury than later, um, as as tolerated by by symptoms, and it, you know I, I think that there's so much more than just symptoms to to consider, um, both falling behind in class plus the social connectedness piece that I think we've we've overlooked for a while uh, in the in the research at least. I I the social connected piece is huge to me. Um, this is something that I looked at a lot in my thesis and will continue to look at in my dissertation is the psychological impacts of just being isolated from your peers, your friends, your teammates, the sport itself, right? There's that loss of like athletic identity, um, all those pieces that really come into play when you're taken out of the classroom or you're taken off the field. Um, so a lot of the stuff that we work on or talk with with athletes is like, how can you get involved? You know, not exasperating symptoms, but how can you still remain connected and maintain that role on the team, right? So you still feel that social connectedness. Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest interventions that we use, especially if I'm working with an athlete with who's, you know, been out with a concussion for four or five weeks at that point is like really maintaining that connection. Um, and I think that goes same with classroom. 
Absolutely agree. I, I, I take it one step further, especially in this uh, second uh, secondary school setting with uh, sleep and phone use. I find out my parents are always looking for an excuse to take away their kids' phones. So this gives me a great, great opportunity for them to kind of snack it from or snag it from them. So and especially with, uh, I don't know if many of you are familiar with Chaminade, we are a heavily, heavily academic rigorous school. Um, so to have these guys come in at uh, seven o'clock at night after practice, and then they have to do some, a lot of homework and then try to get to sleep puts a lot of tax mental taxing on these individuals. Uh, so when we do this, we try to limit the the screen time and take away the phone at nine, kind of what I say, and then have them focus on trying to get the better sleep from, from nine to 10 o'clock and wind down. For anybody looking for um, some help in the classroom for student athletes who are recovering from uh, concussion, uh, Dr. McVoy out in Denver, you guys are doing something out there. Um, has a return to learn uh, program. There is a, you, you can get a lot of great information from that. Um, if you are an athletic trainer in Missouri, you can go to the Missouri Brain Injury Association, or Brain Injury Association of Missouri website, and there'll be a link for you to get free access to, to uh, personalized information. So we can throw that out there for the, for the uh, classroom. So interesting thing about neuromuscular training and reducing concussion, all of your research was done with adolescents. Mm -hmm. So looking at ACL reduction with the neuromuscular training works really well with adolescents, not so much with college athletes. And I'm wondering if anybody's taken a look at that. We're, we're, uh, we're delving into the college athlete population as we speak right now uh, with the students up in Boulder. Um, and... Uh, parents are useful for ensuring adherence, I think is, is one of the things that, that we've, we've realized is, you know, um, we got pretty good buy-in in that study because we could, uh, have an athletic trainer go to meet at the high school or in the community with the patient and their parent, and the parent would drive them there and they would force them to be there. So our adherence rate, as far as like people showing up to actually do it was above 70%, which I think is, is pretty good. Um, we heavily incentivize them with money as well, which I think is uh, is another factor. Um, but as we're we're about ten patients into a new trial, similar type of of approach um, with college students and our and our adherence and even our like no show rates, uh, or I guess our retention rates are well below forty percent. Um, and I don't know. I, I mean, if people have ad advice, I don't know. There's something about especially like the eighteen to twenty year old college students. I'm not pointing any fingers. But, uh, you know, uh, not, not showing up, you know, the, you confirm with text messages and you, know, you say, we're going to pay you a hundred dollars to show up today. And, uh, we've had a lot of no shows and a lot of people just not doing the intervention. Um, so I, I think that there's something about a structured parental environment that could be both good. I think we also see on the other end, uh, parents can be, uh, so anxious and so caught up in things that it actually induces some some secondary effects in, in the children too. So uh, certainly things that, that we're working through. Um, I don't have a good answer. I don't know if you guys do. <laughs> okay. I have thoughts about it. I'm just, I'm thinking in terms of, right, student athletes have so much on their plate. Is this just adding one more thing, right? So I think tying it back to that interdisciplinary care approach of how do we integrate it into what they're already doing on a daily basis, right? Is it bringing sport performance in to say, hey, while the rest of your team is lifting, let's go through this protocol. So one, you're maintaining that connectedness, but you're also being able to implement that intervention. I think it's like looking for utilizing those other folks in those spaces is like where we're going to really get the best results. Yeah. And, and that reminded me of two things is in the ACL literature, they did it as a part of like the team warm up. So you would have coaches and administrators, athletic directors that would buy into this and you could do these kind of randomized control trials at the team level where teams A, B, and C would all do the intervention as a team to your point on social connectedness and everybody's, that's just what we do. And we see these tremendous benefits. Um, I think post-concussion, there's a time and a place of doing things like jumping and hopping and landing plyometrics core work near the team is probably useful because I think one of the challenges that we see with concussion is you kind of disappear and you, you don't like historically over the last like 10 years, we've come a long ways, but it used to be like 
well, you know, so-and-so is just, they're in the training room, just hanging out because they can't come out to practice. Right. So I do think that there's value in like, you're like for that patient. Hey, look, my teammates see that I'm doing something right now, whatever it is. Um, and, and I think the time piece is the other part. We, we did a kind of a feasibility trial of just graduate students around our, our medical campus, um, for some of these virtual, uh, training programs. And the number one barrier to actually doing it was, was time commitment. Right. So I just didn't have 20 minutes today. Um, you know, as you know, the graduate students in here, I'm sure can relate that it's, it's a busy time. Um, and there's a lot going on. And so will you take an extra 20 minutes a day to do this study? You know, I think it was the first thing to fall off as far as, uh, priorities go. Yeah. And, and when you bring up the risk, that, that increased risk of injury, then that's also a double-edged sword, right? It might help and it might not. So the, con, you know, the, our, our understanding of concussion, certainly we've, we've moved on to trajectories of concussion where we, we know that the, the classic line of when you've seen one concussion, you've seen one concussion. Um, so if we, if we look at the trajectories and I'd, I'd ask, um, when you're considering which one of, when you see a certain profile begin to develop, which ones make you just go, no, like this is gonna be a long one. And which ones do you feel you have more success in, in doing either a um, athletic training room based rehab or a, a home exercise program and success with them just kind of around the, the area of the trajectories of concussion? Uh, so I probably have, uh, I, I see concussions anywhere from weeks to even years afterwards, right? And uh, and kids and adults. And I would say my most problematic patient population are like, are the, uh, the hard nose, I'm gonna push through this uh, person because they're, they're the ones who I have to keep reminding that this is not something that you can push through this headache and, and just do, do your daily stuff. You are, if you hit that wall, you're gonna replay that day every single day. And so that's probably my most difficult patient to get through to is just, you need to just this, you are a different person right now with a concussion. You are not the person, uh, the day, uh, day negative one. Right. And, and, uh, and as soon as you buy into this process, that's the day that you're going to start getting better. Uh, I think that the, the like clinical profile trajectories are great in theory, but hard in practice um, in that there's so much overlap from patient to patient to say this one's a cognitive person or this is a mo or a, this is a sleep person or whatever. I think that there's, there's some researchers that have done a good job of trying to outline those things. But I think again, life is more complex than that. Um, I, I, I have a whole nother lecture on prognosis. There's a lot of good research on this. Um, I would suggest that, um, if people are interested in understanding what the like high risk for persisting symptoms from the onset, there is a, a group out of uh, Canada, actually kind of a multi-site uh, group. They came up with this thing called the five P risk score and it stands for something. I don't remember what, but if you like Google five P risk score calculator, there's nine variables that they've derived from an incredibly rigorous uh, design where they, the uh, uh, several year study, of thousands of kids that were admitted for concussion um, uh, in, in the emergency department and with really good predictive accuracy from these nine variables that are like age, sex, and then like history of migraine, re reporting fatigue. Um, uh, there's some balance things. Uh, I don't remember all nine off the top of my head, but you, you can actually like pull it up and there's just like a, a, you click a bunch of buttons. There's a calculator. It's all free. I'm not making any money on this. I promise. Um, and, and again, I think it's like a very valuable clinical tool to say, okay, I can do all nine of these by like doing two tests and asking seven questions. Um, and you're already doing that as a part of your standard of care. And then you can kind of lump people into it's a zero to 12 score. And so if it's nine to 12, then they're in a high risk for developing symptoms for more than a month. And that that's like a 80 or 90% accuracy in the, and we validated it across, uh, uh, several sites in, including, uh, pediatric athletes in, in the St. Louis area, um, uh, over, over the last year too. So I would say from a prognosis perspective, look into that tool, um, if people are interested.
So Scott, what do you do with those when you see those students who are having a lot of uh, uh, ocular motor issues? These kids. So these kids, we there was one really cool thing that we did a number of years ago. An optometrist came in and she brought in these cameras that were came, came from Germany. They put on this headset and they did eye tracking. And it was pretty awesome to see which ones that she flagged for having some abnormalities. And then also the ones that had uh, previous concussions. She even went back and she saw that here she flagged people that could have a learning disability. And she had no idea who these guys were. And I went back and I went to our counselors. I said, do these guys have an IEP, an individual education plan? And two of the three were, were yes. Uh, so these oculomotor guys. So what I try to do with these guys is do a lot of reaction testing with them. And it's easy. I mean, you could think out, we're really good at thinking outside the box. So one of the things I do is a lot of reaction time is turning a Bosu ball and have them stare against the wall. And then I'm just throwing a tennis ball or whatever across their, their body and having them catch it. Or timing them whenever I drop it, having them try to catch it before the ball hits the, uh, the ground again. Um, if I see a lot of discrepancies, then I am sending them, referring them out uh, to more specialized care. In my time at Chaminade, we have only sent three to a pediatric neurologist. And one was not even a uh, sport related. It, well, I guess it was Jim. He ran into the bleachers. So that was a long-term one. Um, if we start to see a lot of impairment with the return to play with some of these sports conditioning, like if they can't, if they have trouble, if they're a receiver and they have problems catching the ball or tracking the ball, then we will we refer them out as well. And then goes with baseball players or whoever, hockey players, soccer. So have you used that optometrist on more than that one occasion? Uh, we have, yes. Uh, we, because uh, it was really cool is because she uh, she baselined the lacrosse players and then also the uh, volleyball players. And it was kind of like during the COVID year where our, our president really didn't want to do a whole lot. However, we did have a couple of lacrosse players that did the baseline and we sent them back just to see, you know, what would what would be happening. And it actually kept them out for a little bit longer. So, um, you know, I steal lines from everybody that I hear talk about concussion and um, Michael Rippey had a line of, there is no such thing as a concussion without an upper cervical injury. So I'm wondering how often you're seeing that in the patients that come through your clinic. And I'm wondering how often you see that the patients coming through your practice as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, it, Yes, like neck problems, certainly. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, there's an incredible overlap between whiplash and concussion, both in me mechanism as well as like signs and symptoms. Um, and I think that uh, right, it's it's all connected. Your your cervical spine is what is, or your your neck function is what is supporting the apparatus. You know, keeping your vision in line, keeping your vestibular system functioning. And so I think that what we're trying to do is understand where deficits are between, um, each and all of those different symptoms or different, different systems. And, and back to what I was saying earlier, I think that there's, there's incredible overlap. And so, um, for us, the testing piece, uh, dictates the, the referral piece. And I think that we're, we're fortunate that we have some very skilled vestibular PTs. We have some good MSK PTs. Um, we have some vision specialists. And so kind of back to that, uh, interdisciplinary team, if, screening and identifying at what point uh, do do you need to seek further care for that specific thing? Um, I think in an ideal world, it would be that clean, but it never is. <laughs> um, and and so trying to trying to do enough assessment to determine where appropriate referral is, um, I think is is the first step. Yeah, I would say the majority of the headaches that I see in con uh, concussion are like occipital like neuralgia pattern. So I that's, I explain it like this is like a whiplash and, and I explain it like tension related headaches and even the patients who I've seen who were referred from neurology who have had this whole migraine uh, headache 
uh, treatment plan and none of these medications have worked and we'll because because it's this is a different mechanism so definitely like we we go after the neck and uh, and try to do all that stuff yeah and we're even in patients six months out to three years out we're seeing really strong correlations between uh, cervical spine proprioception uh, deficits and and dizziness everyday dizziness I think that that's the other piece that I touched on a little bit uh, but some of the manifestations beyond just pain functional manifestations that uh, are not easily treated, but trying to get to the root of those and treat those will, will dictate kind of the course. Dizziness and headache, two pretty simple uh, symptoms, right? Those are easy. Do you have any uh, questions from the chat? We have a question from the audience. Hi, uh, so we just learned how important uh, to reach the 160 minutes exercise for after concussion. So do you encourage the athlete to take the pen mat and to reach that goal? Or if they have symptoms, you don't want them to do anything and take the pen mat and go back home? That's a, that's a great question. I think um, we have not uh, recommended pain medication because I think we want to know what sy symptom exacerbation is. Um, and so uh, kind of our guidance, but also largely like what came out of the Amsterdam statement was that, um, doing early physical activity, um, to a point of symptom exacerbation is, is where you kind of want to stop. You don't want to push past that point to the point of not having to tough it out, so to speak. Um, and how do you define that? And so I think the, the current general accepted is if you have a, a visual analog scale, zero to 10, 10 being maximum symptoms, zero being none, if they increase three points then so if they go from a two to a five when they hit that five then it's time to stop and so pain meds may mask some of that um so uh i think we actually yeah we we've stayed away from them for that purpose um at this point but i don't know if you if you all are doing anything different uh, i mean very similarly especially in the, the acute phase or sport related concussion when i'm when we're maybe a little bit more distance from it and we're dealing with constant everyday high level headaches then all right, whatever, take what you need to have control your headache because we need to eventually break this pain cycle. We need to get you more active. And if this is what does it, then then uh, great. And we, we found something that can unlock that and then we can start having better days. Yeah, that complexity of the headache. What is, what's causing the headache, right? So just keeps getting easier. <laughs> I had a question for you. Um, with headaches, I mean, one thing is with, with these guys and parents, you want to educate, right? So whenever you do have a concussive hit and you're suspecting of a concussion, we always talk to parents about getting proper sleep, hydration, and the nutrition. Uh, can you guys speak uh, about the nutrition aspect of it all? Your, your nutrition, uh, if there's any nutritionists here, I'm sorry. Uh, nutrition is like the furthest edges of human variability meets biochemistry. It is incredibly hard to study, particularly in the context of a brain injury. What I will say is um, I think the, the, the three kind of pieces, if I'm going to borrow from like the, the female athlete energy availability literature that we've really started to focus on um, with uh, relative energy deficiency syndrome um, is the importance of understanding physical activity, um, nutrition, and kind of basal metabolic needs, right? So those are kind of the three elements that drive energy availability and usage in the body. And so um, uh, post-concussion, likely there's an increased demand for energy to the brain to help restore it, but there's also a reduced ability to deliver that energy in the form of glucose um, because of sympathetic uh, nervous disruption or autonomic nervous disruption. And so uh, I think where I'm going here is that we have a pretty, we're starting to understand some of the physical activity pieces. I think there's some animal research and, and some merging in human research that shows that there is an increased uh, need to get energy to the brain, but we have no idea of what mechanism, what food, what, I mean, I think there's a lot of theories. There's there's some kind of shady uh, supplement, you know, <laughs> type of trials that say, you know, do X, Y, or Z that I don't really believe. Um, but, and, and I think you could make the case for a lot of different macronutrients or micronutrients or supplements, but uh, the evidence certainly is not there at this point in time. It's a really good question. I think probably sleep is coming along and I think nutrition will be the next uh, as far as our 
kind of complete understanding of back to what I was saying earlier of like healthy lifestyle factors, like what is healthy to one person to the other? I'm not sure. <laughs> Great question. Yeah, I don't think I have much to add, to add to that one other than I try to say, you know, eat healthy. I don't know, hydrate and the healthy eating. It's not really much beyond that one. And, and back to like, is this going to be bad for any of us? Like if I, if I ate healthier, that'd probably be good for me. I should listen to my own advice, but that's also what I can tell patients with concussion. <laughs> so Chick-fil-A canes, not good. <laughs> I just want to make it. I mean, it's energy. I don't know. I'm, I'm not the expert. Energy is good. <laughs> Well, we have hit that uh, eight o'clock hour. I want to thank everyone for uh, being in attendance. Um, thank the panel for your participation. David, thank you very much for all that you presented here. Um, it was a good evening. It was a nice, it was a nice program. Yes, thank you to our speakers, our panelists, and our moderator uh, for joining us this evening. Um, I do want to make an announcement about the next opportunity to celebrate the SLU athletic training program at the men's basketball game. Um, Tuesday, March 5th at 8 p.m., SLU versus Dayton. Um, SLU students, staff, faculty, alumni, preceptors, friends of the program, uh, all the athletic trainers associated with our program will be honored at halftime at the men's basketball game. Information about tickets will be sent out uh, to the SLU uh, program community, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and one last time, if you have not yet registered, please uh, do so uh, using the QR code. Make sure you uh, can claim those CEUs and expect to see email communication from us about that. If you don't, don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, to make sure you do collect those CEUs. In addition to thanking our speakers, Dr. Howell, our panelists, our moderator, Dr. Newsham, um, I do want to thank the uh, others that were uh, critical in making this event a success. Thank you to the Iota Tau Alpha leadership team for helping me plan this event. Thank you to the St. Louis um, Athletic Training Society for sponsoring the event and the pizza that you're gonna get afterwards. Uh, thank you to Ms. Jada Hubert for her administrative uh, help and support in planning and executing this event. Thank you to the Office of Marketing, Communications, Recruitment and Engagement for uh, the event management and the documenting and helping with the audio visual components of the event. And thank you to all of you, our students, staff, faculty, friends of the program that make this SLU athletic training community uh, so powerful and strong. Uh, we are very grateful to share this evening with you. So please do join us out in the lobby off to the right in the cafe uh, for pizza and reception and to uh, gather in community together. Have a great night.